Good day to you. I obviously am not a woman. At least I hope it's obvious. And that's part of my psyche. But actually, we're going to talk about the plight of women today. And I'm going to lead the discussion, but those of you who are in the class who are women will know it better than anybody else. We're studying women to try and understand the plight of women, the status of women, the fate of women in some cases, across cultures. And that's what this chapter is all about, as we study the status of women around the world. And the chapter starts out with a very important distinction between gender versus sex. They are different. Sex is what you are biologically born with, genital-wise, chromosome-wise, etc. If you're born with a penis, you have the sex of a male. Gender is a culturally defined term that we use to, dis to ascribe certain behaviors to a male versus a female. So, for example, a gender-prescribed behavior in U.S. culture is if you're a young boy, you're given a truck to play with. If you're a young girl, you're given a doll to play with. That's an example of how our culture prescribes certain behaviors based on the perception of a person's gender. In today's day and age, we're actually seeing a kind of an awakening about gender that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And that is an awakening that to gender as, as uh, depicting it as being on a continuum. That is, at one far end, you have maleness, if you want to think of it that way, and at the other complete opposite end, you have femaleness. But in actual fact, the average person falls somewhere along that continuum. You can actually have people in the middle, they might be considered transgender, crossing over from one side to another. And, and Bruce Jenner and, and Caitlyn, later Jenner, is a, a public figure that has personified this awakening about this sliding scale of gender that I'm trying to speak to. Uh, that's for you to decide, but it is taking place as a discussion across the world, gender on a sliding scale. Now let's go to the different countries and how they rank in terms of the, the overall health of women, in terms of, of, of their ability to have a free lifestyle, in terms of their economic power, in terms of their health, and in terms of their education. And those countries at the top of the list are the, the Netherlands leads the list. I don't know if that's current. I mean, they flip in and out those countries, but it's almost always Nordic countries. That means countries in the north of Europe. So the Netherlands is one of those. Belgium is also there as well. And then you have the Scandinavian countries, which are all also called Nordic countries because they're in the north, but they're, they're an entity unto themselves with their, their culture and their history. We're talking about Sweden, Denmark, and, and Norway, but also Iceland, and sometimes Finland is considered in there as well. Um, all of these countries, they have a lot of uh, good rankings for women across these dimensions of health, etc., uh, education. So women are, have the best lifestyle, uh, so to speak, the best lives, I guess one could say, if you're living in the Nordic countries. The U.S. Is, is neither the best nor the worst. The book doesn't show where the U.S. is. It's somewhere in the middle of countries, probably on the upper end in terms of uh, the overall status of women. Let's talk about those individual characteristics. When it comes to health, the gap in, in the difference between men's health versus women's health has been closed. Um, it, it, you know, it's gotten narrower in the last few years that, we, that women have um, almost as healthy lifestyles as men and age expectancy, etc. One of the things that's looked at uh, in this dimension of health is what's known as a sex ratio. And that's to see how many males versus females survive in a culture. And we typically see that in Asian countries, we have a higher ratio of men surviving versus women surviving that the ratio is more like this, whereas in, in, in the U.S. it's more like this. And part of the reason for that is because of some cultural traditions in Asian countries where the, the, the male is more valued as an heir to a family, or in the case of China, is, is, is a means of population control. We'll talk about that later. So sex ratio is something that you can take a look at in more detail in the chapter. Next up is education. We know that two-thirds of illiterate people out there are women. So this is not a dimension that women are doing very well in across the world. Uh, many of the, Ill the illiterate the illiteracy takes place in Africa, uh, where it's understandable. If you know anything about African history, you do know that it was it was colonized um, first by, for for raw materials like ivory and gold. The country of Ghana used to be called the Gold Coast, for example, before it became Ghana. It was uh, settled for gold, um, obviously, and then Africa became a source of slaves, slave for the slavery triangle. The ships going from Europe to Africa, then to the Caribbean, where the sl slaves were offloaded, and then the raw materials that they were harvesting or, or, or materials that they were harvesting, not necessarily raw like sugar, molasses, coffee, were put on the ships and then back to Europe where the whole thing started all over again. So you have um, 
European cultures being overlaid on top of of African cultures, many of which didn't even have written languages. They have oral languages. If you go to Ghana, there are some languages that are only spoken, so you can't have a newspaper in those cultures. And now you're introducing English because the English went there and did slave trading and gold mining, and you're going to say, okay, the English language is going to be the language. So of course, the literacy is going to be lower in a situation like that. Uh, next up is economics. Um, 60% of the gap has been closed. So this is one of the areas where, for women, are doing pretty well across the world. Um, women number more than 40% of the workforce overall. So it's not quite equal, but it's inching up there. In the Scandinavian, in the Scandinavian countries uh, in particular, you have a lot of equality of women. Uh, you have women in the workforce, not just in, in um, how should we say, uh, front-end positions, you know, greeting customers, et cetera, or sales, but actually in managerial and executive positions. Uh, it's very common to see women having high profile positions in Swedish companies. And I've been to Sweden lots of times and, and I, you just feel the power of the woman, you know, and I have to, I have to tell the story I always do uh, because it's, it's so instructive. Uh, if you're a female, for example, in, in Sweden wanting to explore your sexuality, you can go to a nightclub and you can meet a male and the male can come home and spend the night with you in your home. It's perfectly acceptable in a Swedish household, most Swedish households. And in the morning, the, the man would even be invited to, to breakfast to speak with the parents. Uh, their philosophy, I've talked to many Swedes about this, is that they want to know where their daughter is. They'd rather have their daughter in their house than in a place where they don't know or under a bridge or something like that. So it's a, an example, a tiny example of some of the freedoms that women have because of their status in Swedish society. Uh, next up is political participation. Only 20% of the gap has been closed. Here in the United States, we're constantly talking about what's happening with female participation in politics. We had the first candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, who was a female. That was a first for U.S. politics. They're saying that the next election in November is going to bring in a whole bunch of women into the House of Representatives, increasing those numbers as well. We just had a black African, uh, African American female, a black female, win the governor nomination in Georgia, um, the seat of the South, and we'll see whether she is elected. So there's a lot of things happening in our culture, combining females with, with um, ethnic advances and racial advances as well. And let's not forget that, that women weren't able to vote in this country until, I think it was the 1960s, to go check my, my information on that. But um, it was recent, right, before women were even allowed to vote in elections here. And, and that's part of what we're looking at with participation. Are women allowed to vote in, in Middle East and in Arab countries? No, they are not. And in other countries, um, in, in other countries, some women vote, but they're told who to vote for by their husbands, um, et cetera. So that's a difficult dimension to measure. All right. And then the book starts to go into a bunch of countries that you can read about on your own. That's where some of the detail I want to come through. I want it to come through in your own reading today. Uh, we've got Mexico, um, which I have a lot of personal experience with. It is a male chauvinist country, like the book claims. I already gave the example in this class that you would never see a bus driver who's a female in Mexico. Um, the, the Mexican male is allowed to have uh, mistresses. That's accepted. I mean, allowed. Uh, the female doesn't like it, but it's, it's sort of embedded in the cult, wrong word. It's a part of Mexican culture. Um, and uh, also there's abuse of women, um, uh, trafficking and violence in Mexico. Um, not meaning to skew your opinion of Mexico. It's also a very kind country. And, and, and I have a lot of Mexican friends down there and a lot of female friends who and their husbands. And I, I see a lot of equality in the relationship, but I, I do definitely see that the husband is the boss in the actual, um, in the average Mexican family unit. Also, the book talks about China. It does re raise what was known as the one child uh, rule, which is now the two children rule. That's trying to control the population. China does have 1.3 billion people. It's a smaller country than the U.S. It's, it's uh, the fourth biggest country in the world. The U.S. is the third biggest country. And, and not much of China is inhabitable. It's too mountainous. So most people live like Japan around uh, the border, around the uh, sea, around the coast. Um, so China is trying to control its population. You're only allowed to have two children in China. And, and the male becomes very valuable um, because the male is, again, the heir to the family throne and the name. And we talked about ascription in cultures, how important it is in some cultures to have a family name. So the male, na the male is carrying on the Chinese tradition and is more valuable uh, even economically. And so you have a more uh, – it's easier to adopt a female um, in the world because you can have a Chinese uh, – Chinese baby that you can adopt if you want to. So uh, in J Japan, we have a, a country that's also Asian, and it talks about some of the disparities.
majority in legis legis legislative politics in Japan. Only 13% of the legislature in Japan is, is female. Um, South Korea is talked about in the, the book as well. I do want to mention, I heard on the BBC last week that South Korea is going to soon be the country that has the longest life, ex uh, the longest life um, longevity expectancy if you know what that means, in the world. That means a country where you can expect to live the longest, and they're projecting, if I remember the report right, that by the year 2015, the average person in South Korea will be living to 95. It doesn't sound right, but I just know that Korea, it stuck out to me, Korea, South Korea, is going to be the country where people live the longest. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, India, there's a lot of disparity there. You, you do read and hear stories, horrific stories about um, gang rapes that go on in India. I don't know if that's the media picking something and continuing to present it as a theme when it's, it's also being placed as out of proportion in India. But let's face it, there are tremendous disparities between men and women in India. The dowry is still alive and well. D-O-W-R-Y, that's a, a purse that the male is expected to get um, from the female's family upon marriage. Um, so we've got the, the diary. And uh, then next up is the book heads into two final subjects of discussion past the countries. One is marriage and how marriage takes place differently in different countries, whether it's a religious institution or a, a secular institution bringing two people together. And the way that marriage takes place is, is very different. Um, even in our culture, we know that we have some fairly standard gender differences, like you're not going to find the female wearing a tuxedo, for example, but you will the male, and it's probably going to be black in most cases, and the female almost always is going to have a white or an off-white dress, and the bridesmaids are all going to wear the same dress, and the female is going to have the biggest clothing and uh, is going to be queen for a day and is not allowed, you're not allowed to see the husband. We had a, a lot of rituals that go with the average wedding. I myself didn't get married in a, a, a religious setting. We got married at a golf course, actually. Uh, but still, to be legally bound, we had to have a marriage certificate. So we, we drove and got a Quaker marriage certificate from Center County, Pennsylvania, which allowed us to marry ourselves by submitting vows. But still, we had some culturally prescribed rituals um, that we had to do and, and wanted to do, frankly, the, including the reception afterwards. It's all part of the way that marriage commonly takes place in the United States. And you can read about how it's different across the world. And then finally, the chapter ends with gender and communication. And I think it's really messy here, this section. and tries to talk about how women have some similarities in the way that they communicate across all cultures, no matter where they live. But it really boots it. It really botches the attempt, the book. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you on my own that women typically have more nurturing kinds of communication, typically have more empathetic kinds of communication in their tone and what they are choosing to, to do, which is to listen, um, than males. Those are very common traits. Whether those are just from that original homo sapien, one person that we talked about when we started out the class, and that's just a trait that's been carried forward, who knows, or whether it's endemic or, or uh, natural to the, to the sex of being a female or the gender of being a female, that's hard to say. But we do observe those similar traits in women, no matter where you live, at nurturing and also empathy. So as I said, though, I'm a male. So if you're a female in this class, you have the benefit of knowing firsthand what this information brings home to you. Uh, for everybody, though, have a great day.